It's good to be with you this morning, good to worship with you, and we're, we're still in this series looking at what it means to be kingdom people, and we're looking at the Sermon on the Mount from Jesus and Matthew to, to look at what Jesus has to say about what it means to be kingdom people. So this morning, we have the opportunity to look at one of my least favorite passages in all of scripture. Um, so let's read it in a second. I'll, I'll tell you what, don't worry. Um, so this is Matthew 7, starting in verse 7. Matthew 7, verse 7. I'll give you a second to find it. In my Bible is page 881. <laughs> Just in case you have the same one. <laughs> it says this, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. The one who seeks, finds. And the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you, if your son or daughter asks for bread, who will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, we'll give him a snake. If then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give, give good gifts to those who ask him? So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you are here and present and, and living in it. So Lord, we ask that you teach us more about you. Teach us more about who we are in you, so we can be in this place a little bit different than when we came. In your name we pray. Amen. So, the reason I said this is one of my least favorite passages in Scripture is because it's just so frustrating to me. It's a frustrating passage to me, for, and for a couple of reasons. You know, it says, it sounds like Jesus is saying, if you ask for something, if you pray for something, then I'll give it to you. It seems like it's that simple. If you just pray, then I'll give you what you want. And that's so frustrating to me for a couple of reasons. First, personally, it's frustrating to me because I haven't experienced prayer like that. I've asked for healing for friends and not gotten it. I've asked for, for something to change in my life and have it stay the same. I've asked for clarity and then stuck in even more confusion than I had before I prayed. I haven't experienced prayer to be this really simple give and take. If you ask for something, you get what you want. I don't think that that's how prayer works, at least not in my life. That's not how prayer has worked. And secondly, it's frustrating to me for a theological reason because I, I don't like how this passage can make God sound like a divine vending machine. You know, if you go to a vending machine and you say, I want my Milky Way, and you put in your money and you push the right buttons, you get a Milky Way, right? Unless you push the wrong one, then maybe you get a Snickers, and then you're disappointed because there's nuts. But if you, if you do it, right, you get a Milky Way. But, so it sounds like what this is saying, if we go to God and we put in our money and press the right buttons, then we'll get that Milky Way, that thing that we're asking for, right? But I don't think that that's how God works. I don't think that if we just ask God for whatever we want, he'll just give it to us because we asked. And I don't think it works that way because sometimes the things we want are kind of self-destructive. Sometimes the things we want aren't good for us. I think of my little one-year-old daughter, Nora, who would really love to give the electrical socket on our wall a kiss. She just really wants to get a little kid, which is very cute and very sweet and very dangerous. And so if I, as her mom, say, well, that's what you want to do, so sure, go ahead and kiss the electrical socket, that could end in disaster for everybody. The thing that she wants could be really dangerous and really self-destructive, so it's my job as her parent to protect her and find other things to kiss, not the electrical socket. So, <laughs> and I think sometimes we, we want things like that. We want things that could hurt us. We want to stay in that addiction. Or we want to, to stay in this in destructive relationship. We want to stay in this pattern of living that maybe we have that isn't good for us. But I don't think if we ask God to let us stay in these areas of our life that can be hurtful to us, that he's just going to give us what we want. I don't think that God, as our Father in heaven, acts like that. And on top of that, sometimes the things we pray for are harmful to others. At least I know for me, sometimes the things I pray for are just kind of angry and vengeful. And I don't think that God wants to honor those things in us either. So I don't think that just because we ask for something in our prayer life, we're going to get it. Just like Nora, if she asks to give that, that electrical socket a kiss, when I go home this afternoon, I'm not going to let her do it. It's not a good thing to do. So all of this is why this is my least favorite passage in all of Scripture, probably, because it's just frustrating to me. 
Sometimes these things that we want and pray for aren't good for us or aren't good for others, and I don't think God is just going to give them to us. It reminds me of, of an interview I saw earlier this week on The Late Show with Stephen Colbert. Now, if you know Stephen Colbert, and you can we'll put his politics aside, I don't know what you think of his politics, but if you've seen his show, often he's, he's a strong Christian, and his faith shines through. And so he had Oprah on, on this particular show, and they were talking about Super Soul Sunday that Oprah's having on her channel. And then Oprah asked Stephen if he had a favorite verse. And he has some beautiful things to say about his favorite verse, which is when Jesus tells us not to worry, also in the Sermon on the Mount, by the way. You should look it up and hear what he has to say. But Oprah had something else that kind of kind of bugged me a little bit. Oprah said that her favorite verse was Psalm 37, verse 4, which says, Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. If you take delight in the Lord, he will give you the desires of your heart. And the reason Oprah said that she liked this verse was because if we take delight in the Lord, and she said, Lord here can have many different meanings. It's not God, it's compassion, or it's it's kindness, or it's peace, or it's kind of putting good vibes out into the universe. We hear that language a lot here in Seattle. And then God will give you what you want. If you take on these positive attributes, then you'll get what you want in life. You'll get those desires of your heart. And that's what Oprah had to say. And I, it sounds like that's what Jesus is saying in the Sermon on the Mount. It sounds like if we just ask, if we have the right attributes, the right mindset, then we'll get what we want. But I just have a hard time believing that that's how God actually works. Don't you? I have a hard time believing that that's really what Jesus is trying to say. So, John was supposed to preach on this. Um, and I was I admit I was a little relieved that I didn't get this passage and John had to do it and then I could learn from John what Jesus is really saying. But John couldn't be here today. Of course, he's recovering from surgery, which meant I had to do it. So I said, okay, God, here's the challenge. It's your job this week to show me what you're actually trying to say in this passage. And I'm excited to say that he did. <laughs> I think there are, there are two really great insights that I think that I was given during this week as I prayed through this passage and read and researched and did my work to get to this sermon this Sunday. So... Two, two main insights that I want to share with you this morning. And hopefully, if some of you feel the same way that I felt about this passage, we can all kind of have a change of heart about this passage this morning. So the first thing that I learned this week was that the very act of asking and seeking and knocking is a profound act of faith. The very act of just going to God and asking for something is a huge leap of faith for us to do because to ask someone for something is to show your dependence on them. To ask someone for something, whether it's help or healing or clarity or whatever it is you're asking for, you're saying, I don't have it all together and I need your help. And that takes a huge leap of faith to say that you don't have that character trait or that quality or that thing that you need and you need God to help you get it to move forward. It's to recognize that we need God. To ask God for something is to declare our dependence on him, saying, God, without you, I don't have any of these things that I'm looking for. That's a huge leap of faith. Now, it doesn't mean that if we do have God in our lives that we'll always have healing and clarity and help because that's not how life works. But it means that we can't have those things without God. And when we ask him for it, that's what we're recognizing in ourselves, that we aren't enough on our own. We need God alongside us to make it through life. It takes a lot of vulnerability, doesn't it? Swallowing our pride. I have to admit, I I can be a little bit stubborn when it comes to being independent. I can be a little bit stubborn when it comes to getting things done and wanting to do them myself. I remember when I was in college, um, I'm the youngest of four siblings, and I saw my, my three older siblings, when they were putting their schedules together in college when it was time to choose their classes, they were on and off the phone with my parents, and they were asking for a lot of help and trying to figure it out, and they kind of put this puzzle of their college classes together with my parents. So when it was my turn, I kind of thought, you know, I've met with my advisor, I have this, this book, this, this catalog of classes, it wasn't online yet, because I'm old, but um, this catalog of classes, and I, I think I can do it. So I would put it together, and then later I would tell my parents 
what my classes were, and we talked about it. I remember one time my mom said on the phone, you know, Gina, you could just be a little less independent and let me help you if you want it. <laughs> she likes to do it. She had fun putting that puzzle together, and she missed doing it when it was my turn. So she said, you could, it would be okay to just be a little less independent. <laughs> and I, you know, I just kind of thought, it never occurred to me to ask for help because I felt like I had it all together. I can be kind of stubborn like that. And I've had lots of times too, though, when I thought I had it together and I really didn't and I needed help. I remember a year ago or so when Nora was born. For those who don't know, Nora was a month early and spent just about two weeks in the NICU, and that was probably the hardest two weeks I've ever spent. Um, and I, but you know, I, I felt like, okay, I'm, I'm strong, I'm a mom now, I can do this, we can get through it. And so I, I tried to have it all together and be strong for Jeremy, be strong for the baby, and, and keep going and doing things, even though I was in huge pain from having a C-section, and I was heartbroken to leave my baby behind in the, in the hospital when I went home, and, it was really hard, and what ended up happening was I, I clearly didn't have it together, and I started being really bad about taking my pain medication, and so I was I was constantly kind of hunched over because I was so in pain I could barely walk, and I I started I would forget to feed our dog, and I would forget to do all of these things that I had to do, but because I wanted to have it all together, it never occurred to me to ask for help until Susie offered to come and clean my house, which was such a huge gift. I don't know that it ever actually worked out to have it happen, but just to have that offer made me realize, you know, I don't have this all together. Yes, I do need someone to come and clean my house. <laughs> and some parents in the preschool put together a meal schedule, like what we were just talking about to do for John. Um, some of the preschool parents put together a meal schedule and shared it with all of you, and every couple of days we had someone coming and bringing us food. And it was such a help and such a relief, and that was when we started really getting through what we were getting through, and I started healing, and we, we felt like we could actually make it through these couple of weeks in the NICU. But it, it, was, it was all because someone offered. I didn't even ask. I never even humbled myself enough to ask. But that's what Jesus is calling us to do to recognize that we don't have it all together, that sometimes we need help. More often than not, with God, we do need his help. And so Jesus calls us to ask and to seek and to knock and to recognize our dependence on him, even when, if you're like me, you want to be independent and have it all together. Just accepting that help and recognizing when it came was a hard thing. Another thing that, that I learned this week was that um, part of what Jesus is calling us to do is to recognize the help when it comes to us. He talks a lot about receiving good gifts and getting good gifts. And sometimes when we ask, we get so caught up in our asking that we forget to recognize the answer when it comes to us. There's an old story that I heard um, a long time ago about a man who, who actually needed to learn that lesson. And it goes like this. There was a man who was stuck on his rooftop in a flood. And the water was rising and coming up on his rooftop, and he prayed to God, Lord, save me. I need your help. Save me from the flood or I'll drown. And so he sat and he waited, and along came someone in a rowboat, and he said, Jump in, I'll take you to safety. And the man said, No, God will save me. I have faith. Go ahead. So the man with the rowboat kind of shrugged and went on. And then someone came with, with a motorboat, and they said, Jump in, I'll take you to safety. And the man on his roof said, It's okay, I prayed. I have faith. God will save me. And so the person in the rowboat went on, and finally someone in a helicopter came, and they lowered the rope, and they said, jump on the rope, we'll take you up, we'll fly you out of here, the water's coming out. So the man said, no, I pray to God, I have faith, he's going to save me. And of course the man drowns. So he gets to heaven, and he asks Jesus, what happened? I prayed, and I, I had faith that you would save me, and you let me drown. How could you do that? And Jesus said, I sent you a rowboat, and a motorboat, and a helicopter. And you didn't recognize my help when I gave it to you. What a powerful, simple but powerful story that asking takes faith, but recognizing the results of our asking, recognizing the answers that God gives to our asking takes a different kind of faith and a different kind of recognition. It takes faith to ask in the first place, and it takes faith to live then on the basis of the answers that we receive when we do ask. All of that changes for me how I read this passage dramatically. It's not that vending machine God anymore. It's a God who we can depend on and who gives us good gifts. And we have need to have the faith to ask 
and to seek and to knock in the first place, and then to recognize the gifts that God sends us when he answers our prayers. It's not just pray, and I'll give you what you want. It's not Oprah's, if you have these good attributes and positive vibes in the universe, then you'll get the desires of your hearts. It's a profound leap of faith to ask and to seek and to knock and to trust that God will give the good gifts, whether they look like what we're hoping for or not, and then to live on the basis of those gifts. Another way to think about this is kind of kind of a three-step process for prayer. You know, so it's not just an easy two-step if you ask and we'll get to what you want. But Jesus is giving us three three different steps, and there are three action words, right? There's ask and seek and knock. So another way to look like this is to think about it this way. When we ask, that's the prayer part, right? To go to God and to ask, that's our that's our prayer, that's our intercession, that's us going before the Lord and saying, Lord, I need your help, or I need healing, or I need guidance, or I need some help for a friend of mine, whatever it is, that's the asking part. We recognize our dependence on God and swallow our pride and ask. That's step one. Step two, then, is to seek. And this is the part where we look for God's answers. Right? When we actually ask, we need to have our eyes open and be seeking out what God is doing in and through and around us and in the people around us to find the answers that God is giving us. Sometimes they might surprise us, like that man on the roof. He wasn't expecting a robot. He was expecting maybe something miraculous. But they're coming. God will answer. He's promised to answer our prayers. And we need to be seeking and looking and watching out for those answers. We don't want to miss out on God's answers because we just keep asking. We want to start opening our eyes and seeking so we can see God at work, to be curious, to notice what God is up to, and maybe we'll find the answers to our prayers there. And then finally, the third step to knock is that's the action, to go out and to knock on doors. I Last summer, I made it my mission to get to know all of my neighbors, and it took a lot of kind of gumption to get up and knock on the doors of my neighbors sometimes. It took some intentional action to actually knock. And that's what God's calling us to in our prayer lives, to ask him, to seek out his answers, and then to, to take action, to be intentional, to knock on whatever doors God is opening for us in the middle of whatever situation we're bringing in prayer, to step out and to take the risk to knock on what's presented to us and to live on the basis of his answers. You see, so this passage isn't just a self-help guide to getting what we want. It's not a way to push the right numbers and to put in our money to get God to give us the things that we want. It doesn't have to be so frustrating as it has been for me for years. Rather, Jesus is calling us to recognize our dependence on him, to recognize his gifts when he gives them, even if they might not look how we wanted or expected, and to walk in faith through all of life's circumstances. That's the call to ask and seek and knock that Jesus gives us this morning. So the question for us this morning is, how are we asking and seeking and knocking? What are you asking God for? Where are you seeking out the answers? What are you looking for when you ask? And how can you take it that next step further? How can you go ahead and knock on those doors that are presented to you and find God's answers there? So let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you are the one who hears our prayers. And we ask that you give us the courage and the, the boldness to be dependent on you, to recognize that we don't have it all together, but we need your help. And let us ask. Let us ask with boldness and confidence that you will give us the answers. And then seek out your answers and knock on those doors that you presented to us. And then we pray these things. Amen. Mm -hmm.